So um, let's go to Jupiter and uh, get back to the linear regression lesson. And I'm going to start a new Jupiter notebook for today. And uh, if I've kept track, it would be um, class 10. So let's rename our Jupiter notebook. And I always like to hide the header just to get a little bit more space there in my notebook. And escape letter M is the keyboard shortcut to get marked down. Let me get my uh, cursor highlighter. There it is, cursor highlighter to show markdown on the cell type here. And as always, we start with uh, some title. And um, what day is it today? February 12th. 10, 11, okay, I got that right. And uh, three days from Valentine's, it's gonna be a different Valentine's, but uh, order some chocolate online and do celebrate and take uh, a market in some way. Uh, send each other messages and just, uh, you know, we need to try to keep, our, keep cheerful despite the circumstance. Okay. So we are learning about at least uh, linear regression. And this time we're working with some real data, but we're going to kind of have to go back to where we were last class. We already have downloaded the data um, into our work in directory. So we don't need to do that again, but we do need to load again that data into NumPy arrays. So we're working uh, with the data of earth temperature over time. And this is measured as um, what we called temperature anomaly. Remember the absolute temperature is not as informative to us because well, there are seasons and there are different kinds of climate in different uh, parts of the earth, different geographies, and temperature anomaly measures the difference between the temperature uh, on a given region and time, point in time, with respect to a long-term average, a, good, a reference point. So it gives us more information about uh, how things might be changing. So we're going to reload that data, and let's start with uh, loading our favorite uh, Python libraries for engineering computations, NumPy. And uh, from the library that we've uh, introduced recently, matplotlib, we import the module called pyplot. And in addition, we have this um, command that tells matplotlib that we want our plots in line in the notebook. So we are always going to have that header, these input statements to get started. Now we had to, um, we can remind ourselves what we did last class so that we can repeat uh, the steps to get to having that data um, to play around with. And uh, it was around here. We don't need to do, take these steps of um, retrieving the data from a URL because I've already done it. And therefore that data land global temperature anomaly is here available to me uh, in my working directory. But I do want to uh, repeat this part over here, which loads the data from a CSV file into two NumPy arrays. I'm going to copy this over uh, into my notebook. And I'm also going to paste it on the Zoom so that you have it um, uh, available there. So let me go back. I think I'm gonna go back this way and paste it in the Zoom chat. Uh, for some reason it's chosen. So let me paste it for everybody. There it is. And um, when I execute that, several things are happening. I have defined a variable f name with the this long string that corresponds to the file name where I have the data. Then I have used this is the important function that we have used numpy.load.txt. 
this function from the NumPy library uh, reads the file f name. We have given it optional um, delimiter to say that the file, we've already explored that file and saw that the data was separated by commas. Sometimes uh, some data comes separated with colons. And then we have a line that says skip rows equals five. That line, uh, we after exploring the data, we realized that there was some you know, heading information there. Unpack equals true is a command that says, okay, you will have two columns in this data. I want one column in one array and the other column in another array. Now, if you are always, if you want to remind yourself of how this function works, you can always do numpy dot load txt question mark, shift enter to execute, and you will get this extra little pane uh, with information about this function. And it tells you this loads data from a text file. It tells you each row in the text file must have the same number of values, and it gives you what the parameters are, and you can read the manual page for this function. Now, this is also available on the website of the NumPy uh, library with the documentation. And you can always, of, of course, Google it, but sometimes it's, com it's convenient to just pull this up quickly in your Jupyter Notebook as you work with it, if you have forgotten um, some of these details. Like, for example, you might have forgotten, how do I skip some rows, you know, and so on. After you use it a few times, then you probably won't need to pull up the manual page. It'll be there for you. So now we have two NumPy arrays ready to go. And what we did last class was to plot that data. And we always want to do that first. And uh, we use just pyplot. Uh, the, the simplest command is to plot to just type pyplot.plot. Oops. OK, pyplot.plot with the two arrays. Year is the independent variable, of course, the time is something that just moves on <laughs> without us doing anything. The temperature anom anomaly is the dependent variable that we want to uh, uh, plot in the y-axis. Temp anomaly, let me see if I got that right. I'm going to add a colon at the end of my plotting commands, and that is only aesthetic in terms of how the output looks, and there it is. Okay, that is the um, plot of the data that we have. Now you can see, of course, that you know this data is all jiggly about, and that's typical of experimental data. So let's take some notes to there, just to you know notes to self um, uh, about what we are observing there. So this is. Let me add it as a bullet list. Experimental data. Um, let's say always has some noise, let's call it noise. Um, then, you know, but we see a trend, right? And that is interesting, that's pretty. So, well, already someone last class was asking, well, what if I want to find um, a simple curve? Okay, so we want to find a simple curve that fits that data. And that curve, you know, by simple, what do I mean by simple? By simple, we mean um, a polynomial. You know, something that it has a simple mathematical form. Okay, so that's our challenge. Um, we want to closely approximate that data uh, with a polynomial. That is our challenge. All right, so this is what we want to do. We want to fit some curve to this data. Um, now, we want to look for a function that fits that data, a mathematical expression, right? And usually, we have this situation. Um, uh, so now, I want to show you something about Markdown that we haven't shown you before, which is how to get beautiful mathematical equations in markdown cells. We do that using a what's called a type setting um, uh, language, really. And it's called LaTeX. 
And so let me just write a note here. We look for a function that depends um, on certain parameters, okay? And I'm going to write now in the next line um, a two dollar signs, and between the dollar signs, I'm going to write, I'm going to write f of x, okay, f of x equals f, and I'm going to write uh, x a colon. I'm going to write a. These are the parameters, and I'm going to use an under dash to. With this is under dash is going to indicate a sub subscript. This is a zero. So I'm a, a zero, so I'm gonna put a comma here, a under dash one comma. I'm going to add a command now for this type setting language and it's backslash, all the commands are usually with backslash, c dots. This is for centered dots. And finally, a comma after that and a under dash m. I'm gonna close the parentheses for the f let me shift it to execute to see if I got what I wanted. All right, so let me just zoom in for a little bit and show you how beautiful that equation is. That's beautiful mathematics right there. So you notice that it's you've got the subscripts and I got these little C dots right here. These are the triple dots. And uh, that is what LaTeX can do. It can give you this beautiful mathematics. But of course, it's like a different programming language. It's, it's a typesetting language. So you, uh, uh, it takes a little bit of time to learn uh, to use this. And um, I'm going to show you some of the basics. And then we're going, I'm going to show you a trick for learning to... Uh, to, for learning more LaTeX. So I'm going to use again the dollar sign to say, so say um, we have dollar sign n plus one, because I want that n plus one to be shown to me with beautiful mathematical typesetting um, data points. And the data points, I'm going to use the dollar sign again to indicate that we're starting a mathematical equation. And I'm going to write the parentheses x under dash i comma y under dash i. So that under dash indicates a subscript in the LaTeX language. And now I close the parentheses and I close the dollar sign. And I'm going to add a new ex mathematical formula expression. I'm going to write i is equal to zero. I'm going to do backslash c dots to get those beautiful dots between zero and n and close that. I'm going to shift enter to execute and then go back to it. And you can see now n plus one and xi, yi, that is now typeset beautifully as mathematics. Okay, so um, we have those data points and I've said that we want to fit the equation above. And um, next, I'm going to write another note here. We're going to choose the form of dollar sign to get beautiful mathematics, fx, by inspecting the data. And perhaps knowing something about the data. In this case, you know, you, we've been watching the news for some time. We, we see the trend here. The temperature does seem to be increasing. We kind of, we're going to try to fit a straight line to start with, okay? All right, so this is the challenge now. And what we want to do is choose the form of this function and then compute the parameters uh, for that best fit the data. And we're going to do that with the least squares minimizer. least squares of what? Okay, so uh, I'm going to now pull up the lesson. Uh, let's see, go.gwu.edu, eng comp one lesson five. I'm going to copy that. And let's see, pull that uh, again here. That's our lesson. I'm going to put that now in 
the chat for everybody. So you can pull up that lesson uh, to have it handy. Okay, so here it is. And I'm going to scroll down to the, to the, to the part where we show you the mathematics. Um, okay, so this is where we were right here, the best fit, and I'm showing you this mathematics. Now, okay, here's where it gets interesting. So now just follow me and like, don't try to type this, just take a moment and uh, watch me do it. And then I'm going to teach you uh, something quite neat, a trick. I'm gonna close this one from last class. Um, okay, so how? So the idea of least squares uh, fit is going to be the following. I'm going to write an equation. I'm going to use the double dollar signs. The only difference is that the equation is going to be centered uh, in the column page. So I'm not going to write this because I, you know, I have some experience with LaTeX. You don't need to follow along because I'm going to teach you a shortcut. So S is the, 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 the function that we want to minimize. So A zero, well, this is a zero, not an O. Uh, C dots to A M and I'm going to close the parentheses. I want that equation and I'm going to use backslash sum under dash. I'm going to use curly brackets to indicate that all of this is together. Um, I equals zero. So you don't need to follow along here because I'm showing you just, you know, I actually know um, a lot of LaTeX. It took me years to learn all of this, but you don't have to because you are in another age, the age of AI, and I'm going to show you a little trick. So y i minus f of x and outside the square brackets, I want um, a square. So I'm going to shift enter to execute and now I have that beautiful equation. Okay, so this equation is showing um, the function that we want to minimize. Let me make that a little larger. And you don't need to worry about the fact that you haven't copied that into your notebook yet. And I will teach you why. So I'm saying, okay, there's a function I'm calling S. This function depends on some parameters that go A0 to AM. And it is the sum from I equals zero to N. N indicates, remember from the previous line, the data points, the number of data points, and I'm taking the difference between the actual data value at the y position and the function, I forgot here, the under dash i in this equation and all of that squared. Okay, so here's where, um, look at that, just briefly look at that again, that's the LaTeX language for typesetting mathematics. Well, there is an app that is called mathpix, I'm going to go to mathpix.com to show you this app. Now I'm going to go back to the lesson. So this is the full Jupyter lesson and I'm going to show you how it works. I'm actually going to click on my look. I already have that ap application installed and I can click on that. And now this gives me the ability to select from my screen an equation that I saw on a website anywhere, I'm selecting it. You see my screen now, uh, what I'm doing? It, uh, okay, I just installed that. So I need to do an extra step in this case because I've, uh, um, I, if you have a Mac, you'll have to do that. I'm sorry that I, I didn't do this before class. I just installed the application um, in this computer. So this is an extra step that I need to do. Might as well show you. Okay, I'm gonna try that again. Um, select that area of my screen, boom. And now it's immediately giving me the code and it's copied that code into my clipboard. This is works both for Windows and Mac. It's showing me on the preview what the equation look like. And oh my God, isn't that amazing? I just love it. Okay, so I, I, I had a little nerd moment there. Okay, so now we go back to this and let me double click on that. Shift enter to execute and I will give you the link so that you can get that up and paste it. And okay, so it's giving me a, a more fancy version. Let me just double, it looks almost the same. What did it do? So it looks almost the same, right? It, 
uh, okay, not quite because the I, I pasted it from the lesson, right? That had a few little differences from what I just typed by memory. And the difference here is that uh, left dots, I'm not, the sum is the same, right? It did left square brackets instead of just the empty square bracket, which I had done. The difference between the square bracket like that and left square bracket is that this is adjustable in size to whatever the contents of your mathematical equation are. So it gave me a more robust version of the same code, but as you can see, it looks about the same. And, you know, and then I go to the other equation here, the next one, and I'm going to do it this again. Um, I'm going to choose that one now. This equation, boom. And it's given me here the code. It's also copied that code into my clipboard and it's showing me a preview of what it detected from the image and did OCR on that, optical character recognition, and it gave me the code. So I can now go and shift enter. Uh, so dollar signs, double dollar signs, just to center the equation. And this is how you do a partial derivative with LaTeX. And it's showing, sorry, this is the partial derivative right here. This is a fraction. And I'm going to shift enter to execute and there's the beautiful equation. So if you're interested, here's the link in the Zoom. And uh, you have to, of course, download this application math and it's uh, as easy as what I just showed. Uh, it works on any website, anything you're showing on the screen, there's this little demo and it gives you the LaTeX code for that. Uh, it, you can paste it on several applications and um, uh, it's just an awesome little tool. And by the way, you can even take a picture with your phone and get that. I, I did that as well some time ago to, to um, um, uh, to to find a, so I think I, I think it's in the OCR tab. Um, show original. Well, I'm not quite sure where where it is, but I have uh, another one that I have scanned with my phone, and it is um, then recognized as well. It even is able to. Uh, search the internet with the equation and land you at the Wikipedia page of that that mentions that equation. So it's that crazy, uh, the tool. So back here, um, this is just to show you a wonderful little tool to learn how to use LaTeX to get beautiful equations on your Jupyter in your Jupyter notebook. And now back to linear regression with a pause for questions. Now let me explain the this 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 part what we're what we're doing here. So let's see. Do you see there? Um, this is my 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 iPad. I'm going to just make a little sketch uh, to illustrate um, what we're talking about with linear regression. So. If we have, you know, a set of data points, okay. Oh, it's recognizing. I don't want that. It's not. <laughs> I, I, um, it's recognizing that as a as a letter, and I don't want that. What if I do this? All right, there. Okay. Um, okay, and I have a few data points. Again, it's. I have a few data points. Um, that go like that. And we say, okay, we're going to fit a um, line to this data. The best line that you can imagine that fits that data. What is that line? Well, that line, the idea of least squares is that um, I will compute the distance between the point and this line for every data point, and uh, this is the idea. I'm going to draw these vertical lines that 
indicate the distance, vertical distance between the data points that come from my experiment or my observations that are the, the, the blobs in blue and the corresponding Y value of the green line. We're going to want to find that green line, which is the line that best fits the data. And in such a way that the sum of those vertical distances squared is minimized. Okay, why squared? Because if I compute the distance between the green line and the blue blob here in my sketch, some of those values are positive and some of those values are negative. So if I just use the difference and sum up all the differences, some of these things will cancel out. So by taking the square of the value of all of those uh, vertical distances that I've drawn in my sketch, then I am minimizing that, then the idea is we're getting the line, green line in my sketch that approximates the data with the minimum deviation, with the minimum error. That is um, uh, just the general idea. Okay, <laughs> um, I'll have to practice that a bit more with my iPad to get that just right. Okay, so this is what this formula is saying right here. Why I would be, if I scroll up a little bit, we've said here that the data points are X, I, Y, I. For us, Xi is the value of the year. Yi is the value of the temperature, the temperature anomaly, right? So these, this indicates our data. Yi is the data. And the difference with F at Xi, F would be the function that we're using to approximate the data align in the case of linear regression, but sometimes we might do a another higher order polynomial. And we're taking the difference, those would course, that difference corresponds to the black little distance, vertical distances that I drew on my sketch, taking the square and then summing them all up. This expression then is the sum of the squares of these differences. We call those differences the residual, yi minus f of xi, we call the residual. And then if you recall, how do we minimize a function? This is from your calculus course, we minimize a function as by taking derivatives and making the derivatives equal to zero. Derivative with respect to what? We already have the data, yi. What we want to find is the values of the parameters in the function that make the sum, um, that minimize that sum. So we take the derivative with respect to the parameters a, a k, with k um, taking all the values of the, all the parameters. So um, some notes here, I'm going to add, actually I'm going to leave that, I'm going to make it in a new cell so that you can still see the equation while I'm typing here some uh, new, new things. Uh, I'm going to use a single um, dollar sign to write this part of the equation, just uh, aligned um, uh, to the left um, of the column, y under dash i minus f of x under dash i. Uh, that is called uh, residuals. Okay, let me shift enter to execute to see that it actually does um, typeset properly. And it's called the residual, residual typo there. And um, and represents the discrepancy between the data and the fitting function. Okay, and what we want to minimize is the sum of the squares of the residuals.
That is the idea. And to minimize the sum of the squares of the residuals, we take the derivative and make that derivative equal to zero. Now, in the lesson, we have the full derivation that arrives at the expression for the parameters for the case of linear regression. Um, but I, I won't do all the derivation in class, of course, you can go back and read it, but uh, let's go ahead a little bit to just say here um, for the case of, I'm gonna make a subheading linear regression. What that means is that we assume a linear, I think I'm gonna make that heading a little smaller. We're going to assume a linear relationship between the um, a linear relationship for the data. So f of x is a line essentially, right? f of x is a line. Okay, so it has two parameters, the y-intercept and the slope. Okay, so two parameters, the y-intercept and the slope. A straight line, of course, you're probably used, you're probably used to y equals mx uh, plus b, but we're gonna write it a little bit differently and don't let this confuse you uh, because we just wanna be consistent with the um, the, the, the general expressions we wrote before. So I'm going to write the equation f of x is equal to, in this case, uh, it is equal, this is algebra, a under dash zero plus a under dash one multiplied by x. I'm going to close that, um, um, the dollar signs to get my equation, shift enter to execute, and now you see the expression for a line. This is the same as mx plus b, where ai is the slope in this case, a0 is the y-intercept. Um, so what does it mean to, uh, what is the sum of squares in this case? Okay, let me shift into, let me I'll go into that cell again and add the sum of squares that we want to minimize is now s, and now we only have two parameters a zero and a one, only two parameters. And we want the sum from um, i uh, equals zero to n of um, the difference between yi and the value of f, this, the, 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 lin, the line there. So my, minus a zero, minus a one times x and close that parentheses and square and two double signs. So let me shift enter to execute and show you the equation. And of course, if you wanted to type that equation, you could go to the lesson, scroll down here. There's the expression. I could just um, grab that with math picks and get the code but I could also just uh, give you this code in Zoom for the moment and maybe make that a little tiny bit smaller, maybe remove my camera. And uh, is that about it? Now, let me scroll up a little bit more. And so let's have a look now. Let me just, you know, I, <laughs> Um, absorb a little bit. If I'm scrolling through a Jupyter notebook, how I can start making a Jupyter notebook something that is really complete in terms of using regular natural language descriptions with beautiful equations, with code, the output of that code in these figures. And that is what allows us to use this platform for something like very rich in terms of um, um, collecting our knowledge that we're building while you know, you're learning, you're uh, writing notes, and uh, you're able to, to, to really make a nice object to help you um, solve some problem or, or yes, organize your thoughts about something. So this is really what makes Jupyter a really nice platform for, for us in engineering computing, engineering computations.
Okay, so have another look at this expression. We're saying we're going to fit a line to the data uh, where A0 represents the y-intercept, A1 represents the slope of that line. And we're saying here, if I take the difference between the value, okay, I forgot to put the under dash I here, between the value um, at the XI position of the line with respect to the, 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 the measured data point there, X, uh, Y, I, and take the squares of that, sum them all up, that is the sum of squares. To minimize the sum of squares, I would have to take the derivative of this expression with respect to A0 and with respect to A1, and then I those two derivatives we have to uh, make equal to zero and then uh, work through to get expressions for A0 and A1, our parameters. All that derivation is in the lesson. I wanna tell you that the full derivation of these equations is often missing from books and from many sources that you might find linear regression. And we took the much care here of, of writing every step. So if you're interested and you're a person who's rigorous and wants to know every step, we did go through every step here and um, you can go back and follow uh, the, the, the algebra here. It's a, it's a bit long and we've written all of that out step by step. Finally, we get to this expression here, an expression for A1 here, let me make that larger in fact, so that we focus on that expression. 11, the expression 11 is a formula for A1. What was A1? A1 was the slope of the line. And once you have A1, you can get A0, the y-intercept as a function of A1. And in these expressions, X bar and Y bar represent the average, the mean value, of our data in the, the X and Y components of our data. So X is the mean value of all the X uh, data values and, and Y is the average of the Y values. So if you see in this equation, okay, we have the sum between, uh, for the sum for all our data points of YI multiplied by the difference between every data point in X and the average of X. The, this expression in parentheses is the same in the denominator, but here it multiplies xi. Okay, so let's, let's just, because this is beautiful, use again the power of math picks to pick out that expression to see the power of this thing. And I'm going to now, it's showing me how it looks and it's showing me that it copied that into the clipboard. Now I'm gonna go back to my notes and um, after a lot of algebra, we get and we do have to add, I believe we do have to add the dollar signs. I'm gonna double check. Yes, we do have to add the dollar signs to, you know, to denote that we have a LaTeX equation. I'm gonna shift enter to execute to um, um, render the equation and you see here that the equation is, is correct. So showing you that equation, I want to pause for a moment for an exercise that you think might not be necessary, but I, I guarantee, guarantee you that it is. And it's the following. Pick up a piece of paper and a pen and write down the first few terms in the formula for A1. You know, what, what do I mean by the first few terms? This formula has a sum and another sum, a sum in the numerator and a sum in the denominator. So imagine that, you know, I, I should take the value from zero to N, just write the, write out ex, the full expression on a piece of paper for I equal to zero, I equal to one, I equal to two and, ex and, and take the time to do that right now. I'm gonna give you three minutes. I'm going to pause the recording and then maybe some of you will um, want to share your expressions and we can debug them on the screen. 
Okay, we had forgotten the recording. So Python functions. Uh, in this line, we define this function f of x to, uh, to be able to compute this polynomial. And what I'm going to add here between triple, single, or double quotes, it doesn't matter, is a comment that is like, um, you know, for the future, what this function does. If uh, f of x uh, computes um, my favorite polynomial. Ah. Often we want to add in a new line what the arguments are. And we usually have like, um, if this is just um, uh, custom to add what the argument is and what type it is. X is a float and it is, you know, a numeric input. Let's just say that. And what is Y? Y is also a float. And it, what is it going to be? Well, um, uh, the result, let's just call it the result. Usually you have something a little bit more descriptive, descriptive here, but I want to show the basic um, pattern of what we call a doc string, which means that we've given uh, this function a little manual page uh, that describes it. So if I execute this line again, so notice this input counter now changed, uh, this was also still a function, but what changed is I could use now the question mark with f, notice here, f question mark, and now it tells me f of x. f of x computes my favorite polynomial. And here are the arguments, and it's telling me it's, I've created a little manual page for my function that is here between the single quotes or double quotes, what we call a doc string, the documentation for just this function. And it is very good habit to always write doc strings for your functions because as you start making more complicated functions, you forget um, how they work. And you can't imagine how quickly you forget. Within two weeks, you have no idea why you write this, why you wrote this code the way you wrote it. So this is what the doc string does. And here's a simple Python function. So what are we going to do next? Uh, we're going to write a Python function to um, um, compute the coefficient in the linear regression. So first of all, Okay, first of all, we're going to compute, we're going to write a function, the first thing that we're going to do, um, to compute the mean value uh, of the elements of an array. This is the first exercise we're, we, that we're going to do. Write a function to compute the mean value of the elements of an array. And then we can use it with, um, our data because we're going to meet, need the mean values in our function, in, in our expression for a, a1, right? So let's do that. I use the keyword def, D-E-F. Let's call it mean value, why not? It's always good to use human readable names here. What do we need to pass to this function as an argument? Well. If I want to compute the mean values of uh, the mean value of the elements of an array, at least I have to give the array to my function so I can um, work with it. So triple quotes to write the doc strings. And this is going to just say what this function does, calculates the mean value of an array, uh, the arguments, well, we're gonna give it, we called it array. This is just, the, we gave the, this name and it is a NumPy array uh, of uh, the input. And what does it return? It returns a, we're gonna call it mean. And this is going to be the mean value. It's a, let's say that it's a float to be specific. That's the type of the return value. And it is the mean value of the elements 
This is, uh, uh, in fact, a feature that is being provided by Jupyter in this case. And if you use another editor uh, to write your code, to write your code, uh, they might choose different colors. But it's quite common for editors or computing environments to use what is called syntax highlighting. The colors indicate the role of that word in your code. In this case, the green is a keyword of the, of the Python language, and it recognizes that what has to come after that keyword has to be the name of the function, and it's giving me that color so it makes it more readable for me as a user. Okay, so I, I realize that we're running out of time, so let me just write the um, contents of this function and use it to compute the mean value of the year, suppose. Uh, this is not going to take very long. I'm going to create a variable that I'm going to initialize to the value zero. Then I'm going to write a for statement that goes uh, through the array for element in array. And I'm going to add elem, I called it. I'm going to add the same, the element and save it into this. So uh, there's a trick here. So I could do some element is some elem plus element. Um, and, uh, but we can also write the same thing here, skipping this bit in the middle. No, let me just leave it that, that way. I'm just going to say that this is the same as doing some lm plus equal element. So there's a shortcut to do that same um, calculation, uh, but I'm not going to go into any details. So how do we compute the mean? After we've summed up all the elements, we have to divide by the length of the array. And now that we have the mean, the last step is to return this mean value um, to the user. So here we've defined it. And once I've defined it, I can use it, mean value, for example, with the array year. And if I shift execute, I obtain a value. There's not a lot of meaning to computing the mean value of the year, but we're going to have to use that value in our formula anyway. So let me stop there uh, because um, it's two minutes past our, our allocated time. And I'm going to stay here, feel free to drop off, but if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them.